So that was the main course, and now for dessert, um, we have Nora Liu. Um, uh, Nora Liu is the other co-founder of the Manitoba Center for Health Policy, um, has uh, also had an awful lot of responsibility for keeping all those fences mended, um, not only at the provincial government level and the privacy uh, commissioner level, but uh, also uh, the academic community, uh, outside researchers, which as you've heard, uh, is um, a, a, it's a principle of theirs to try and make data um, available to outside researchers whenever they uh, are qualified and bona fide. Um, and in the process, she has built a reputation uh, across the country as, um, as an expert in this field, and I think that's the reason that she was chosen to chair the peer review panel for the competition that funded the FAR Institute. Um, so um, we all uh, in Canada owe her a debt of gratitude, and I think in some ways the, the record linkage community internationally owes her a debt of gratitude. Um, I won't read out all the things she's done. I will tell you that she's not really retired in any way, and she's now full, fully engaged in a program of work. It's, it's funded by a peer-reviewed grant to intervene with science journalists and health journalists to try and improve the quality of their coverage. And maybe she'll tell us a few stories from uh, the coalface. Nora Liu. Well, it's a real delight to be here, I must say, um, when we were got involved in reviewing all those grants with enormous amount of material. Um, had no idea it would be an opportunity for me to come to Edinburgh, which I haven't seen in you know probably 30 years, and to wander around. It, it's really been fun, so thank you very much. And you know, I am delighted to have the opportunity to talk to you about and my focus is on sort of not the health data, because you all, I'm sure, have health data and know you can use these data in administrative databases for looking at interesting things. But what we've gotten involved with over the past, you know, probably now 10 years in Manitoba, has been working with additional data sets which we add to the health database from education, from family services, um, children in care, children receiving protection services, income assistance, families who are in income assistance, recently been adding housing data for identifying all the families who live in public housing. Um, and as Les said, we're in the process now of adding justice data, which I won't be talking about because we don't have it yet. Or actually, we do have it, but we haven't figured out how to use it yet. But these multiple databases, and I ha have to say, given the, the question back there about how do you go from working with these databases in a population of a million to working with what you're dealing with is something which I won't try and answer, but I think you should definitely be considering it. So first of all, I thought I should let you know where we're coming from, which is Manitoba, right there in the middle of Canada. And it is true that it can be quite cold. In fact, last Friday, I'm told it snowed. Now, it won't last, and I'm told this coming weekend it's supposed to be 29, so spring has been somewhat delayed in coming to Winnipeg this year. But it all happens in about 10 days. It'll go from nothing to everything green. So it, it's a remarkable place to live. Since both Les and I come from sort of the west coast of North America, we've adjusted uh, rather well to, to Winnipeg. There are a lot of people, both investigators, programmers, assistants, who work at the Manitoba Center. 
As Les said, you know, it's fundamentally supported by the fact we have five-year contracts with the Manitoba government. We undertake for this specific set of what are called deliverables. And I'm going to list a whole series of recent deliverables to give you an idea as to sort of what is involved in these annual reports which we do for the government. We are, we negotiate with them what these topics are going to be. They have to be something that we can do with administrative data. They have to be something that they're interested in. We often go forward with proposals. Maybe we'll take 20 proposals and they, can, they pick five or six of them. And we also have a working group, a couple of people from the government as well as people from the agency, how are Manitoba's children doing? We would have pediatricians involved to advise us on what are the important questions. We know the data which we have, but they are also helpful in telling us you know, what, what should we be looking at, what are the important issues. Um, so there are a whole series of these reports which we do. The sort of social housing in Manitoba, one of the things which you do whenever we bring in a big data set is we negotiate that year, that will be one of our deliverables, figuring out how to work with the data set and what are the kinds of questions which we can answer with the new data set because these are not easy things to simply add in. I'm, I'm driven crazy by people who think when you start working with administrative data, you just push a button and you get the answer out. You know, it doesn't really work that way. So this has been um, an interesting process, trying to figure out how to use these data to interest and keep the government involved in, in what we're doing and providing support. However, what I'm focusing on today is all research, well, not all research which has been supported by outside grants. Government has been part of the deliverable process in identifying some of these things. But basically, it's looking at this thing which your Sir Michael Marmot suggested a long time ago that the real determinants of health are not necessarily how many physicians you have, how many hospital beds, but it's the social determinants. Health is more than health care. So we got involved, if you know, Judy is the first author of this. Doug Judy is a young pediatrician based in California, University of California. We were introduced actually John knows him, Len Syme is uh, somebody who said, you know, I've got this guy who I really would like to work with your data, he's terrific, you should sort of have a conversation with him. So we did, he is terrific, he writes well, um, and he led this project which was comparing the impact of biologic factors which everybody's familiar with how important birth weight, gestational age, and Doug was also interested because on every birth they record the one minute and the five minute APGAR score, so which is essentially how healthy a child is at birth. And so he also wanted to include that. We also had from the database um, series of social characteristics, so maternal age, the marital status, and socioeconomic status. We looked at two different types of outcomes. One, because we could look at the entire experience of hospitalization which a child has over childhood, so from age zero, or sorry, one day, to 19, or 18. Um, so basically how 
how much use have they made of the hospital, how sick has this child been over the course of, of the childhood. And what was the performance, educational performance, on this grade 12 exam? This is an exam which accounts for 30% of your graduation grade. So it doesn't necessarily, it's not high school graduation, but it's a big part of whether you're going to graduate. It's a fairly significant event. And so we're looking at how social predictors and biological factors both predict are associated with these two different outcomes. First one we're looking at is this all-cause hospitalization over childhood. And it's not surprising, and I don't have a, a pointer here, but on the left-hand side, we're looking at these are the biological factors. So no surprise if you have a very premature infant, they have much higher rates of hospitalization over the course of their life, although this may have been early on, you know, we didn't look sort of which years did they happen in, but that 212 compared with full-term infants who have 34 to 37 um, hospitalizations per thousand over the course of, of the 18 years. Same thing with birth weight. Very low birth weight child, no surprise, very high rates of poor health as the indicator. APGAR, somewhat related. Also, if you look at the three social indicators, and those are on the same scale, so we haven't sort of masked this with a little manipulation, um, maternal age, very young mother, we're not saying anything else about the child, not in terms of birth weight, et cetera, not controlling for anything. All we're controlling for is age of the mother. That's right up there with premature birth in terms of risk factor over the course of this child's life. Similarly, socioeconomic status of the uh, family and marital status is also associated. That was with health indicators. This is with educational outcomes. Again, no surprise, these very premature infants, these very low weight, birth weight infants, do not have good long-term educational outcomes. They are kids who are at risk. However, you look at maternal age, you find very similar kinds of things. This is under 18 and over 30. I actually had my second child 20 years after the first. I call it Les's midlife crisis. I was 45 at the time. <laughs> So I tell my daughter, pointing to this graph, you know, when I had you at 45, I did everything I really needed to do for you. <laughs> Socioeconomic status, similar, very strong relationship, and, and marital status, strong relationship to high school outcomes. Now, I've laid this out carefully because, as Les will be the first to tell you, I am not a statistician, but what Doug calculated was population attributable risk. So what's really important in predicting the disease outcomes for the population or the educational outcome for the population? If you look at sort of individual risk factor times how many people are there in the population who experience this risk? And if you think about it, no surprise, the population attributable risk from the biologic factors, because how many very low birth weight infants are there? Not a lot. On the other hand, how many children are there born into low income families, to very young mothers, to fam unmarried families? Lots. So, this was one of the most intriguing papers which has come out of our center in a long time. 
It was turned down for publication five times. Finally was published in an epidemiology journal. Whenever he would present it at American, journal Pub American Public Health Association meetings, everybody loved it, but it was somehow, don't know whether they didn't believe it, they didn't like it, it was an enormously difficult paper to get published. It doesn't always happen, but that was one of them. And in fact, looking at the, comparing the health and well-being of children from the poorest, this is we divide, the, use census data to divide neighborhoods into the wealthiest quintile to the poorest quintile. And these are the kinds of differences which you see across these neighborhoods. Now this, I'm not usually this dramatic, but in fact, this is not something which I wrote. But one of our people who work at the center, and when we got the education data, and Les said, you know, four years, 364 days, what that referred to was the fact that we were, I had worked with three ministers, something like seven deputy ministers to, in education and family services, to persuade them that they should deposit their data routinely at the center. And everybody sort of thought this was a good idea, but just sort of couldn't get around to doing it. And we had the signatures from health, from family services, and we needed the signature from the deputy minister in education. There had been agreement from the minister, and then we heard that the deputy minister in education was moving to Ontario. And I couldn't get a hold of him. We had, if, we, if he didn't sign this letter, I knew we'd have a new deputy, we'd have to go through everything else. And I said, that's it, you know, I won't go after it. He, the last day in office, he signed the, the literature, the, the letter. So we had the education data, and this has been one of the most intriguing things that um, we've come up with. This is what we talk about getting the true story. As with any new data set, you take it in and you figure out, you know, how do you, um, how do you accurately capture what this data is all about? And so this is going back to this exam that um, everybody is supposed to write in grade 12. That's 30% of their grade. And we started you know, trying to get, do some analyses which would show us um, these outcomes. And one of the first things we always looked at is performance by socioeconomic status. Needless to say, this is an interest of mine. Here, we have, before I said we divided things into quintiles, here we're still working with, these are basically quintiles, except now they're quartiles. And we pulled out everybody because when we got the education data, we also got data on all the families in the province who are receiving income assistance. So these are really low income families, which we're identifying not by neighborhood, but we now know the individual families, and it's a powerful measure. So we pulled out all of the kids who in high school, family had received income assistance. That's who's in the far left corner. And when we looked at people who had failed the exam, those are in red versus those who passed the exam, this was, this was our first result. I thought, well, you know, there's the expected gradient. If the gradient wasn't there, I wouldn't believe it anyway, but it's there. But it's really, you know, it doesn't actually look that bad, which seemed a little surprising. It also was sort of complicated because we found 
that it wasn't just that some people passed the exam and some people failed the exam, it was also a problem that some people didn't seem to write the exam, that there would be something on their record which they started the exam but didn't finish it or didn't write it or there would be other codes that we sort of couldn't quite make out. So then it occurred, and it wasn't, didn't occur to me, I don't remember now who it was, who came up with the thought that after all, we've got that population registry. So we knew all, we could go back into the birth records. See, all the kids born in Manitoba 17 years ago, who, again, we could tell from the population registry, who still lived in Manitoba. Because in Canada, it turns out, when you leave the province, you typically are moving to another province and you have to qualify for health insurance. So they write back and forth. That's why the registry tends to be very up to date. We've compared it with census data, et cetera, and our, our numbers are, are very good. So it occurred to us that we could identify everybody who should be writing that test. And then we could look and see, you know, where were they? Maybe we had some people who should be writing, but they hadn't yet made it to grade 12. Or, you know, maybe they dropped out of school, et cetera. So when we went through all this, we've actually taken the green numbers are exactly the same on the left and the right. But we've added to this over here the sort of red, no, the pink bars are those who are, have dropped the course, absent, etc. This came from the educational data. We also could add those this far. These are people who are in grade 12, but there was no mark for them for the test. So the teachers hadn't asked them to take it or what they were not being, they were in a class which wasn't allowed to take it. There was something weird going on. The gray bar are people who are still in school, but they haven't made it to grade 12 yet. And the black bar are people who have dropped out already, been out for at least a year or two. So the real story, and I can assure you that the deputy ministers of education, the superintendents were incredulous, that they had no idea that this was what the real situation was. And they weren't necessarily happy about what the real situation was. But because we had them involved right from the beginning, I mean, we were trying to figure out, do our data make sense? So we would be going back and forth, telling them sort of what we were seeing, what bump, and that's what led to the uh, comment on the previous page. You, you, will, you know this exists, but you don't really know this exists. And we ended up, the fellow who came up with that statement gave over 200 talks to different school districts and superintendents associations and meetings the year that we started working with the education data because it was seen as so basically traumatic. And what they were saying was, that if you can know this, why can't we know this? And they started working to get much better data for themselves. Um, one of the things which we, defensively people were saying when they saw, let's go back, when they saw this people on income assistance, et cetera, the very poor performance of those who are in the sort of 
poverty situation. I said, well, you know, often these are kids who get into serious trouble. You have mothers with drinking problems. These may well be kids where you've got a very high level of intellectual disability, and that's what explains it. You know, it's not really anything that the schools could do that much about. So we've got data from the schools identifying who has, is identified as having serious intellectual disability. They qualify for a special fund. It's identified there. We also have data from the in diagnoses from the physician claims, the hospital claims, which we looked at. And so we looked at what's the performance of people identified with intellectual disability. No surprise, in fact, reassuring given the data, there is a big um, difference in terms of whether they're passing this exam. And again, no surprise, there's a much higher rate of children identified with intellectual disability in the um, lowest income group. However, what we then did was to go back to those slides you initially saw and say, okay, how much difference does it make when we exclude those with intellectual disability? And basically, it doesn't make any difference at all. So, the question which then came back to us was, well, how do these kids differ at birth? You know, do you find that kids from the lowest income group basically do have much poorer um, health outcomes when they're born? So we first looked at birth weight by those those socioeconomic groups. These are the kids and families with income assistance. What percentage were low birth weight? No relationship to the thing. High birth weight, a little bit higher in the lowest income group. Diabetes is a big issue in our aboriginal population and there is somewhat more high birth weight there. Our heaviness and tends to result in high birth weight, or related to high birth weight. But the huge majority was a normal birth weight in both groups. Same thing when we looked at, at um, mother's age at first child, so the very young mothers versus uh, everybody else, no difference that you can detect. In fact, very young mothers tend to have very healthy babies when it looks when you look at birth weights. So another way in which we looked at these social risk factors was to <coughs> identify three characteristics. Was the, did, had the child experienced poverty? Did the child have a teen mother? And had the child ever been in care or receiving protection? And, you know, Manitoba, remarkably high percentage. We have a large Aboriginal population. Um, they have significant issues, although this certainly was not strictly at all an Aboriginal issue. And when we put them together to see, we did one report looking at when these risk factors start to pile up. And no surprise, the more risk factors you have, the poorer the child's outcome. So this is the likelihood that a teenage young lady is going to become a teen mother for the, turns out, about 70% of the kids who have none of those risk factors, teen motherhood is simply not an issue. 2% of them become teen mothers. However, 
if you have one risk factor, two risk factors, or three risk factors, your likelihood of becoming a teen mother goes up astronomically. We also looked at so sort of where do these kids live who have high risk factors? And this is Winnipeg. We have an inner city, which is where the lowest income um, individuals live. These, this is sort of the outer inner city. I think we live, where do we live? Here? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not very good with maps, as Les will tell you. <laughs> Um, all by socioeconomic status. And so we looked at, because we could look at the characteristics of all of these kids, what percentage of kids, this is zero to 18, living in each of those neighborhoods had one or more of those risk characteristics. And one of the things, and, and I would strongly advise you to do this, when you start doing reports at the Manitoba Center, I hate it when people rank things alphabetically, you know, which has nothing to do with anything. So all of the reports at the center are either ranked by healthiness of the population, where you use something like life expectancy, premature years of life lost, et cetera, or socioeconomic status. And it turns out it doesn't matter which one you use, you tend to get things ranked in the same way. So this is ranked by socioeconomic status. The highest income neighborhoods are at the top and the poorest income neighborhoods are at the bottom. As you can see, in those poor neighborhoods, something like 80% of the kids have at least one of those risk factors, and something like 60% of them have two or more risk factors. So again, we used this with, made this available to the um, ministries that we work with, and they sort of, everybody knows this, but you don't really know this until you start putting numbers to areas that you're very familiar with and that you're responsible for. And that has turned out to be very interesting. We do have sometimes good news for the ministries. And that is we've shown, I mean, it's child and family service. In fact, um, I think I don't know if Ruth Gilbert is here. I understand she's going to be here. She's done some work with, with Marnie Brownell on taking kids into care. Manitoba has one of, not one of, has the highest rate of taking kids into care of any of the countries that were part of, of their study, Australia, US, UK, and, and Canada, Manitoba, which, was stunning news. Um, but this was also very interesting because we've done all sorts of work which shows that kids in care are incredibly at risk for all sorts of reasons. This is children in care, rates of hospitalization for different types of things over a period. This is age match, so that's not an explanation. And they have much higher rates of hospitalization than in young children they're compared with. But in an interesting study that one of the, the um, psychiatrists did, he looked at hospitalization rates in the year before children come into care relative to the rates after children are in care and found that there was, in fact, a significant reduction in rates of hospitalization. So these are not kids without risk factors, you know, where they are, um, 
And this was something which, again, was very interesting to the ministry. However, this, this is the last sort of report that I will be talking about, and it's a particularly interesting one because there aren't many things I've found that in analyzing these data that I end up saying, you know, I don't believe that when you see the first. In fact, I've always been right before that if I don't believe it, it's because it's a programming error, that somebody is really screwed up or mislabeled or something. And this was the first report which the center did with this new housing data. So we're looking at individuals who are in social housing. They're low income, qualified. It's typically, it's a mother. I think you get higher rates of access for mothers who have single mothers with kids and low income, disability, when individuals who are on disability get higher priority. But it's really sort of income based. You can't, you don't have access to housing without having sort of income issues. And so they were comparing, again, we've got our socioeconomic quintiles. So these are the lowest, na poorest neighborhoods. And in fact, in Manitoba, they have sort of social housing, government housing, in across the city. So it's not just concentrated in the inner city. It's located throughout the, the city. So in high income neighborhoods and low income neighbors. Not as many. There's more in sort of middle income neighborhoods. But um, one of the things which they looked at was rates of vaccination of kids. And so for zero to two year olds, how many kids had a complete set of vaccinations? And they compared, in this case, families, kids and families who were living in, in um, supporting housing versus everybody else. No surprise, and again, it gives you some faith in the data that there's somewhat higher rates in the highest kids who are not in supportive housing who live in the highest, um, most affluent communities. But I think this is, again, a testimony actually to the Canadian healthcare system that there's not a whole lot of difference in vaccination rates. They all look pretty good, and there's not much difference although they're always lower, the children in um, supportive housing doesn't seem to matter which neighborhood they live in. They, they have sort of lower rates, but not hugely lower. So they're about, what, 55% versus 62% in the lowest area, compared with 72% versus 52%. So similar, not identical. And this also, they looked at, this is performance on the early development instrument. This is the um, testing kids when they enter school as to how well prepared are they for school. So again, no surprise, this is the percent judged not ready and it's high, these are people not in social housing. So you have a considerably higher proportion of those in the lowest income neighborhoods compared with the highest income neighborhoods or middle income neighborhoods. So it is socioeconomic related. And basically no difference but higher rates of people being, of children being unready for school um, in families who are in social housing. So again, the data makes sense. This is where it gets interesting. These are graduation rates. So we look at what percentage of kids living in each of these areas graduate within six years of entering grade nine is the score we use. 
These are kids living in the inner city, in the lowest income group, who are not in social housing. So only about, what, 48, 7% of them graduate compared with in the highest income neighborhoods or middle income neighborhoods, up about 80% of the kids are graduating. But what is fascinating is these are kids in social housing and compare their rates with these rates. And my first reaction was, I don't believe it. I, felt, I didn't think they'd adjusted well enough that they had sort of needed to go back and, and look at the data. <coughs> but when they looked at teen pregnancy rates, they found exactly the same thing. So, you know, this is not in social housing, SES related, no surprise. If you live in high income areas, very low teen pregnancy rate. In all of the areas, those in social housing have higher rates, but these rates are significantly lower than these rates. So the conclusion which the authors drew, and I finally had to agree with them, was that where social housing is located matters for older kids. OK, so this is, I don't look at that a lot. But I think is what we need to be thinking about in terms of what do we do about some of these issues. And I have to say, in terms of sort of working with the manager of the government, that there has been a very responsive interest. And you know, they will tell you that they have actually changed significantly how they fund schools. They are funding, putting significantly more funding now into inner city schools on a per student basis um, than was true before these data started coming out. They've been doing a number of, of other things. And the Deputy Minister of Education and I did a joint paper which we presented at, at uh, Perth at the the last meeting of the whatever it is, bringing you guys and everybody else together who works with secondary data. And this was his sense of what has the government learned from working with the Manitoba Center around these issues. Les mentioned the advisory board, people are on it, that you need to develop sort of collaborative discussions around this that, you know, this is what you know, they were saying, you know, when you put these data on the table, they're difficult to ignore. And, um, but developing these relationships built on trust is, is very important. From my perspective, um, this is, is what I think researchers have learned over the years. Remember, we did research with these data for, I don't know, five, ten years before the government got involved in investing. And the government actually, every year or every two years, we would bring somebody up from the states to say how terrific this research was. And they'd say, oh, well, I guess we can give it to you for another year or so. But they really just wanted us to go away. They didn't want to know about it. They were, were probably worried that somebody was going to blow up whatever. But Les got some grant or something, something huge, like $20,000 to work in Brandon that the government had put money into. 
And so he did some analysis for them. And all of a sudden, they were extraordinarily interested in what we were doing, what we were finding. You know, if they were supporting it, then they expected to get something out of it. So um, having the government commit some money is important. We found reporting at the level of a deputy minister is very important because sometimes you get staff members who don't like what you're doing, who feel threatened by what you're doing. Um, if you can go to the deputy, go to the minister, it's very helpful. This report evidence, not policy solutions. We once did a report and came out with, I don't even remember what it was on, but sort of it seemed to lead to that one should do X policy. Well, it turns out, and we had that in the report, and we tend to get a lot of media coverage when we put it out. Turns out the ministry had been working on a policy for the previous two or three years, which was totally, would have accomplished the same aim, but was totally different than what we were recommending. And yeah, we totally screwed them up and they were not pleased and the delay, you know, so we never specifically recommend policy solutions unless it's sort of worked out and you know somebody, this is what needs to be done and, and going. Um, we have a five-year contract renewable every three years, which we've always said um, you know, if you come in and want to get rid of us, it's your option. But because we bring in academics with appointments, you know, we can't operate on a short-term, year-to-year basis. And we were successful in persuading this, so we sign, re-sign a five-year contract, but every three years, which is relevant coming up because we've had an NDP, a socialist government for a long time now who's expected to go out in the next election and so we're sort of hoping the center survives. Um, we don't take on confidential projects. Public release clause after 60 days. When we first started, we would deliver the report to the government. They would then have, it was then released on their time frame. And what we found was work with government, they always have a thousand things going on. And so things just never got released, which would drive us crazy because we wanted to publish, etc. So the next contract we put this, they can release it any time within the first two months after we deliver, but after that, so we can release it at any time. Arms leave, etc. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.